Good morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us, tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Today is Thursday, December the 23rd, and well, we're close to Christmas. So I hope everyone is uh, patiently getting through this time of year. For today, we are um, gathered in the peace of the Lord as we study the inspired and true word of God this Advent season to see Christ who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The light shines on us today from Matthew chapter 7. And I think Matthew 7 is two of the most commonly quoted verses in the whole scriptures. And I'm not saying they're always used well, but I'm saying they're commonly quoted. Judge not lest ye be judged. For whatever reason, people know the King James version of that. And do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Both of these are nice sayings. They're actually good sayings for us to see, but often are they quoted correctly? We're going to find out today. We hear Jesus speak to us and slowly see the whole picture of his Sermon on the Mount. For the gifts are ready, ready for you. Helping us to be strengthened by God's word this morning, we welcome the Reverend Justin Panzer, District President of the Kansas District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod in Topeka, Kansas. Pastor Panzer, happy Advent and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Thank you, Pastor Finner, and it's a pleasure to be with you and with your audience. Pastor, uh, this is our first time together. Um, tell us about you, your family, and the work of the saints at the Kansas District. Absolutely. Uh, I was the uh, formerly the pastor of uh, Faith Lutheran Church uh, in Abilene for uh, 16 and a half years uh, before becoming the, uh, the district president of Kansas. Uh, just briefly, uh, what happened was uh, Peter Lang, who was our uh, district president, was elected to the Senate uh, first vice president position. And uh, by default, uh, since I was the first vice president of Kansas, uh, that uh, that uh, made me the uh, the district president. So it's uh, it's been a joy uh, to serve uh, in this capacity. It's uh, definitely not without its uh, you know its frustrations and and also uh, you know many many good things as well. But uh, I do enjoy. Uh, visiting the people of God, being with the people of God, and uh, and working with them in whatever way possible. So it's uh, it's always I tell people that uh, every day is a uh, a new day for me, and uh, it's really hard to to schedule some days, uh, you know, if if unless things are really kind of pre planned in advance. As far as my family goes, uh, I've been married uh, for over twenty years uh, to Shelley, and uh, we have two children. Uh, my son is uh, Eli. He is a uh, sophomore in high school, and my daughter is Greer, and uh, she is an eighth grader in middle school. And uh, both of my children are adopted, so we were uh, uh, not blessed uh, to receive uh, children uh, the natural way, but the Lord did bless us with two adopted children, and so we are grateful for that. And uh, so now we have two teenagers in the home, and. Uh, and like any uh, family with two teenagers, uh, you know what that's all about. <laughs> well, I'm into that. Uh, two things uh, that are, are are notable is, first of all, you live currently in Wamego, Kansas. And Wamego, Kansas is very near dear to my heart. That's my grandfather got remarried after my grandmother had passed when I was a young child, got remarried and lived on Wamego. So I have very special memories of that town. And so Wamego is good. Well, Amigo is good. Yeah, we had lived in uh, Abilene for uh, for 20 years and uh, had planned. Uh, when I became district president, we had we had actually planned to move to the kind of the northwest side of Topeka uh, to get a little closer to the district office. Um, and then with COVID and things like that, that was moving was really the last thing on our minds. Mm-hmm. And um, and so it was really May of this year. Uh, the, the decision, kind of the opportunity to move to uh, Wamigo came up and and really long story short again, uh, we ended up purchasing a home here in 30 hours and selling our home in 30 hours. And so the <laughs> Lord works uh, definitely in mysterious ways. So it's roughly uh, 46 miles from my home to the district office. Uh, however, I tell people that if anything good came out of COVID, it's that uh, we can work remotely and we can do it well. Mm-hmm. I do uh, do quite a bit of traveling, and I'm on the road quite a bit. Uh, for example, in the month of November, I drove uh, 4,100 miles 
Ooh. And so, so really, as long as I have my computer and my laptop and my cell phone, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty mobile that way in terms of work. Wonderful. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll say, I'll, I'll ask this final question. When you, when you stand in Wamigo, you look to the left, you look to the right, you have two universities. And this is an important question in Kansas. K-State or KU, where, where's your allegiance? <laughs> well, uh, uh, I'm actually a graduate of uh, <laughs> KU at Lawrence. And so uh, but we are roughly 15 miles away from Manhattan, which is Kansas State. So uh, just a funny antidote here. Uh, when I went to the seminary uh, at St. Louis, uh, you know, you know, a lot of my friends were either at that time Concordia River Forest or, you know, Concordia St. Paul, uh, you know, alumni. And so to fit in with them, I, I jokingly said that I went to Concordia Lawrence. That way I could feel like I was a part of their group. <laughs> well, I'll just share this. My, my grandfather, my step grandmother, I guess you call her. She was this tiny little gal, nicest gal in the history of humanity. And one time I said, um, so are we going to go to the Kansas University basketball game? And she just about threw me to the ground. So it's a serious deal there in Kansas. Anyways, it is. Yep. Well, pastors, and, it, and it's uh, the University of Kansas. So you got to say that right. Oh, no. See, that's probably the other issue I had. So anyway, yep. anyway, so, so, so pastor, as we join together today, we're here to be in the word of God, Matthew chapter seven. And can you ask the Lord's blessings upon our time in God's word and prayer? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I've uh, I, I picked out a prayer uh, that I think goes well with uh, kind of the whole theme here, not only the Sermon on the Mount, but also in this text that we're going to look at. This is actually from the Lutheran Book of Prayer. It's the, the 71 copyright edition, and the prayer is called Remembrance of Baptism. So let us pray. Lord God, I am your child. I call you Father because you are my Father. You named me with your own holy name even before I could speak. You made me your own before I could move a hand to help or prevent you. You insisted on having me even though you knew the end of my life as well as its beginning, its shame as well as its glory, its failures as well as its achievements, its bad as well as its good. Why, Father, should I persist in resisting you? Why should I insist on my own way instead of knowing your way of grace and love? Why should I obey my own whims instead of letting your grace and baptism have its way with me? Forgive me, Father, for so often wandering into a far country away from you. Your forgiveness, your joy, your promises, your love in Jesus Christ. Help me to live in the freedom of my baptism by the faith of my sonship in the life which you daily renew by your gracious forgiveness. I am baptized. I belong to you, God. Abba, Father. Abba, dear Father. Amen. Amen. If you have any questions concerning our text from Matthew chapter 7, send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, kfuo at kfuo.org. And this is just a reminder that if you even have a comment or a thought, send us an email or you can call into the office. But send us that email because there's a lot coming up uh, in Matthew chapter 7 and also throughout the book of Matthew. And we'll be studying Matthew until Easter. So just uh, we're going slow and taking our time. So we're ready to dig in and to see the riches of Christ in this text. So, Pastor, we, we're, we're, we're covering some very common ground, words that people are familiar with. Um, but we also want to make sure we have it correctly. So how do you want to start us off today? Yeah, I think I would say this, and this is, you know, not knowing, you know, how the other, uh, you know, pastors have, have gone before me as, as we study the book of Matthew here. But again, just to put before the, uh, the hearers here that um, context is king, you know, something that you and I uh, learned well at the seminary, uh, that we need to, uh, you know, know what's going on, not only before, but, but also what's coming ahead. Uh, of the particular text uh, that we are looking at so that we can give a, uh, a right translation, a right interpretation of it. And so for our context, we, we most definitely want to remember that uh, this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus' long sermon uh, here in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. So as you look at that, what is there an, as, you, as you say that, is there an overarching 
I guess you say, theme of of how Jesus is, is speaking. It's been fun to hear different perspectives on that. But if you were to say, okay, this is what the Sermon on the Mount is about in a in a short confirmation um, idea, what would you say? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, just briefly, I mean, I think we all know well the Beatitudes in, in Matthew chapter 5, and, and really that's the Beatitudes that set the context. They set the stage for everything that uh, that's going to be coming up in this long sermon uh, that Jesus has, you know, especially the end of those Beatitudes. You know, Jesus just tells his believers that, you know, you will be reviled, you will be persecuted, um, you know, you will be slandered. Uh, but he tells us what in verse 12, to rejoice and be glad, right? Mm. Because your reward is great in heaven. And then he gives us our marching orders, so to speak. I mean, as his baptized, you know, what does it look like? What do we do, right? He tells us in verse 13 of chapter 5, we're the salt of the earth. Uh, he tells us in verse 14 that we're the light of the world. And I think that if then we jump ahead here to chapter 7, uh, you know, we see some very uh, you know, strong words here of, you know, how do Jesus's disciples treat one another? And, and you reference those, you know, at the beginning of this broadcast with verse one and then with verse 12 as well. And that's, and, and that's something I, I really want to share some personal stories of these texts and kind of like, okay, that person's not wrong, but they're not quite using it correctly. And this is why I love how you started about context is to understand the context where we don't just, you know, go after people with, with the Word of God in a way that it wasn't meant for, but also patiently and lovingly teach what Scripture is saying and how that relates today. Because, like you said, context is king. Pastor, is there anything else you want to uh, highlight before we start digging in? Uh, I don't think so. Thank you. All right. Well, let's open up our Bibles and get started. We'll be reading from the English Standard Version of the Holy Scripture, Matthew chapter 7, and we'll just read verse 1. Jesus says, Judge not that you be not judged. Pastor, it sounds it sounds simple. Um, I've heard it said many times in our culture. What is what I mean, what is Jesus saying here in verse 1? Yeah, so I think I'll give you, let's give the context side first, right? And so the, the context side, again, tells us that uh, we have to see this in light of the Beatitudes. And, we, and so we go back to Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, and in that verse, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, uh, for they shall receive mercy. And so, you know, what a beautiful word uh, mercy is. You know, I always had, had, had defined mercy uh, to my people at Abilene there is, you know, mercy is, is not getting what you deserve, right? Mm -hmm. And so for, for God to be merciful to us, um, that's a beautiful thing because what we deserve is, is nothing but death and damnation. But instead, he, you know, he meets all of that out on his son on the cross and he gives to us, you know, his righteousness, his innocence uh, instead. And so... Um, again, we need that mercy. We live in that mercy. And, um, you know, the disciples of Jesus, uh, we are merciful, uh, because we've first been shown mercy and that mercy is not only a present reality for us, uh, but it's also a future reality too. And so we, we, we can't forget that, can we, right? I mean, we, we live in the mercy of Christ now and because we live in it now, uh, it is promised to us on the last day as well. And so we're looking at this with a, a resurrection theme as well, that the mercy is here now and the mercy will be there in the future. So therefore, judge not that you be not judged. It's kind of weird English for sure, um, but this is commonly quoted. And I want to I share this story with you and, and see what your, your thoughts are. Is there's a wonderful young lady that I knew in my first congregation, just a great gal. Um, she was in her 20s at the time, and one time she walked out of church, and I saw on her arm Matthew 7, verse 1, that she had tattooed on her arm. And at the time, I didn't know it right offhand. I, I should have, but I didn't know it right offhand. And I said, hey, tell me about that. And she goes, oh, it just reminds me. I look at my arm, remind myself, okay, don't do that. And I was like, okay, I got to look this up. <laughs> so great. So, and, and it totally, and we had some good conversations throughout our time there. It was totally a more of a context of 
okay, don't judge anyone ever as in your life. And, and so we can look at this and boom, just end in verse one. And that's what we think of it is that don't judge anyone about anything they do at any time ever. How would you respond to someone who thinks of this verse that way? Yeah, I would respond to it uh, a couple of ways. I mean, let, let's think of it first in terms of being a parent, right? I mean, if I'm going to try to raise uh, godly and, and God-fearing children, uh, then there has to be judgment upon them. There has to be discipline upon them uh, for, for wrong actions. Because if I fail to do that, if I fail uh, in a loving way to correct my children for their wrongs, uh, then, then who knows what, you know, their life is going to look like or end up like, you know, as Christian parents, we are called, uh, to judge them by their wrong actions so that, yeah, through that, uh, behavior might be corrected and life might be amended. And so that's the same thing that we've really got going on here, uh, in Matthew chapter seven, verse one, right? I mean, Yes, it does say, judge not lest you be judged, you know, if you go back to the King James Version, (laughs) but we do judge people. And how do we judge people? Uh, We judge them not from what you or I think is right in our own eyes, but we judge them uh, with what the Holy Scriptures say. Uh, We judge, right, uh, in light of of the Ten Commandments. And uh, those Ten Commandments, that Torah, that instruction of God, uh, is, is the basis of, of what we look at, of what we go to uh, as, as Christian believers. And again, we do that in a loving way, though. And that's where the rest of our context, and I, I love how you're, how you're telling us that, because there is, if you just read verse 1, it can lead you in a whole bunch of directions. First of all, don't judge anyone ever. And clearly, as we read more, that's not what he's saying, but we have to make sure we're very clear on it. Or we're kind of like, well, I don't agree with Jesus on this one. Because <laughs> you're kind of like, wait a second. Um, clearly, there's judgment throughout the whole Bible. So if we just stop at verse 1, we're kind of left in this, you know, extreme measure. And, and that's what the beauty of the Sermon on the Mount is. It doesn't, it doesn't allow us to stay in the extremes. He, he puts us in the place where we need to be um, as his the ones who have received mercy from the Lord. So we probably should keep moving before we go too far into trying to figure out something without more of the context. So anything else you have in verse one, Pastor? Uh, no, I agree. Yeah, definitely. You, you can't read verse one, obviously, without reading uh, verses you know, two through five, especially. Exactly. So let's keep moving. Verses two, and I think we'll go through five. Go through five. Verse two. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, Verse one is, is commonly known, and I would say the rest of those verses is commonly known as well. But once again, we got to make sure we have the context correctly. So how would you teach these verses to someone, Pastor? Yeah, I would, I would teach the verses like this. And, and you know, as, as you mentioned at the beginning, we're in the season of Advent here. And so, you know, what does Advent call us to do? Advent calls us uh, to a couple things, not only to an awareness, uh, of our sin, to repent of that sin, to turn from that sin, but it also focuses our eyes upon the Savior who has come and who will come again. But to turn that back uh, to me uh, personally, right, I am called uh, to repent. And uh, when I first became district president, you know, I, I asked uh, a couple of, uh, actually a couple of former district presidents from other districts in the Missouri Senate had reached out to me in a, in a very nice, loving way, of which I was very thankful. And, um, you know, I asked them, I said, you know, what's some advice uh, that you could share with me? And uh, advice that I received uh, was one of them was this. There are 31 proverbs. Uh, there are basically 31 days in a month. Uh, read a proverb a day, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, one of my, uh, as I've read the Proverbs and reread the Proverbs uh, month by month, 
uh, Proverbs uh, 1727 has really stood out to me. And that says this, whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cruel spirit is a man of understanding. And uh, I've really latched on to that uh, phrase there, cruel spirit. And, um, you know, a person who is patient, a, uh, a person who is restrained, a person who uh, is not hot-tempered. And that really gets us into... Uh, I believe what Jesus is saying in, in these verses, right? If I have an arrogant or prideful spirit, uh, then I'm going to be blind uh, to my own sin. And if I'm blind to my own sins, then I fail to see where I have personally uh, fell, uh, where I have personally fallen short uh, of the glory of God. And because I have these personal thoughts, because I have these personal sins, I need to confess them. Uh, I need to repent of them. I need to be turned by the Holy Spirit, and I need to receive that grace and mercy and forgiveness in Christ. And that's something where, as you mentioned before, that we're called to be salt and light, you know, in this world. And the natural reaction that we all have, and this is just proof of our brokenness, we see something wrong and we want to act like we're all police officers in this process where I know the law, I have to go, I have to go after this, got to bring it out and tell people what they've done wrong when that log is in our own eyes. At the same time, I've seen it done the other way where it's kind of like, you can't ever tell me I'm doing something wrong. Because you should probably take the log out of your own eye. And then you're like, then you're caught in between a lot of dynamics, which is why I love how you said it's about the hypocritical nature of all of us to realize one, I am indeed a sinner and I need to repent myself so that when I go to the other person, I'm doing it in love and, and care for that individual as opposed to my own agenda, which I don't know, pastor, that's, that's pretty hard. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, it's very hard, isn't it? And I would say... You know, you, you try to approach people in a, in a loving, uh, biblical way. You try to promote, you try to approach them, excuse me, you know, with, uh, with humility. And, and as you well know, and as your, you know, as our listeners know, you know, sometimes that just doesn't work, does it? I mean, it's just no matter what grace, no matter what humility, uh, you may bring to a certain situation, uh, you're, you're, you're more than likely a, a sheep thrown into a wolf's den. And so again, what, uh, you know, what greater need do we have that, but to show that humility of Christ and, and not lash out, you know, even though that's going to be our first reaction that we want to give and do. Uh, so again, um, you know, t taking it back here, I mean, as I receive the forgiveness of Christ and then as that forgiveness of Christ lives out in me and salt and light. Uh, Lord willing, you know, we have the promise, we've got the scripture's promise that that's going to, you know, radiate from our lives to the other, to those around us. And so I think that we look at this text too, um, you know, not only do we have to be in the word ourselves as pastors, but even more prominently, you know, the people of God need to be in the Word, and the pastors need to encourage the people of God to be in the Word, uh, because we've all heard of this thing called biblical illiteracy, right? And um, and and so with that, um, it's going to lead to all sorts of bad things, uh, bad engagement, bad congregational meetings, um, bad interactions between members, uh, taking the Scripture out of context, uh, you name it. And then the church is not built up and edified that way at all. And I do, I do think about, you know, you've referenced Dr. Gibbs a number of times as you look at today's text, and we've had Dr. Gibbs on this program. And one of the dynamics is this is really telling, this is what believers are to do to other believers. So this is like a, a kingdom situation where, where, e, where a believer addresses another believer and, and tells them, okay, this is the sin, or this is, you know, a concern we have, so forth. And obviously checking our own heart first in repentance um, and trying to come humbly, you know, First Peter 5 is, is one that God, you know, opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That's what we need to receive and realize in our own issues. 
And this is an important piece for us as a church. How do we address each other? And why, from your time as pastor, as a district president and so forth, why is it so important that we <laughs> see this in light of the church and how we are to live together? Yeah, so I think, I think first of all, yeah, just, I mean, obviously, uh, Dr. Gibbs is uh, somebody who had a great influence upon me as one of my professors at the seminary in St. Louis and, and taking the gospel of Matthew with him. Yeah, I mean, who is who are the scriptures written for? The scriptures are written for believers. So, you know, again, how do believers interact with one another? That's a, that's a very important statement for us uh, to keep in mind as, as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, as we go through Matthew chapter 7 here. I think the flip side of that is, um, you know, I've, as, as district president, I, I've been in some, some very, very bad meetings. And uh, you hate to rate your meetings, but some of them have been awful. And um, and they've been awful because the, the people of God, uh, you know, ultimately was not in the Word of God. And so, you know, again, patiently, lovingly, uh, whether it's through myself or the circuit visitor or the vacancy pastor, uh, you encourage that Word of God upon them. Uh, you, you push the Word of God upon them, so to speak, right? You, you get them to the point to where... You know, like the book of Acts, you know, you want them to examine the scriptures daily uh, to see if what you are saying is true. And uh, and nothing but good can come out of that because we've got the, uh, the promise that God's word will not return void and empty. So uh, praise God for that and, uh, and, and praise God for the faithfulness to his word. Praise God for those who are faithful to his word and and praise God for pastors who bring that faithful word too. I heard one pastor say it this way, and actually a lay person said it this way is, um, I heard it numerous times from people is our goal is to be placed under the word of God, meaning, okay, here's the issue, but let's get, let's put ourselves under the word of God so that we understand where we are in relation to God and then instructed by his word. And I can't think of a passage that passages that really remind us of that is when we gather together and there's issues as a family, even and as as a church, as fellow believers, this, this passage right here is a very key one for us to read in context, all five verses to remind us, you know, we all have to have fallen short and come to the foot of the cross and need his grace. And so when we do this, we do so needing help last sauce before we take our break. Yeah, no, I think just the last thought would be, uh, again, we pr- we approach this humility, we approach this with grace. Uh, you're still going to be labeled as a hypocrite, though, uh, unfortunately. And and again, I think, you know, we're, we're us, uh, we as the Christian people, we, we've got to, you know, we've got to not just tag along with that attack, so to speak. We've, we've got to keep our head. Uh, we've got to keep that cool spirit. Uh, because we know that we're going to be attacked. And, and, and as long as we know that, you know, we have repented, uh, we've received that forgiveness, that's what we want to extend to them as well in, in, in the way possible. Uh, and then, you know, the Holy Spirit, uh, again, we've got the promise of Christ that he's going to give us the words uh, that we need to speak in that moment of time. I think that's an important piece as we look at the hymn, Prepare the Royal Highway, the King of Kings is here. We got to always remember the King of Kings is with us. But right now, Pastor, we need to take our break. We are studying Matthew chapter 7 with Pastor Justin Panzer, and we'll be right back. Take a look around you. Look closely. Immigrants in the United States and their U.S.-born children now number about 81 million people, or 26% of the population. So chances are, there's someone right in your community who doesn't speak English as a first language and who doesn't know Jesus. The Lutheran Heritage Foundation can help by providing you with free Lutheran books translated into over 90 languages. See their complete list of catechisms and Bible storybooks at lhfmissions.org. Welcome back. We are studying Matthew chapter 7 with Pastor Justin Panzer, District President of the Kansas District in Topeka, Kansas. 
And I didn't do this at the beginning, so I'll do it now. Thank you to our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation for your support of Thy Strong Word. To support their great work and to find out more, visit lhfmissions.org, lhfmissions.org. Now, Pastor, we, I think we've covered this very well, and it's good for us as we looked at the context. Verses 1 through 5, I want to say they fit pretty nicely. Like, okay, what am I supposed to do? Repent. Um, how am I to address my brother I and mean, brother and sister in Christ? We do so with humility. At the same time, here's one thought I have, is that if, when someone addresses us as a brother and sister in Christ, that we, I know me specifically, should be more patient when they bring out the wrongs that I've done because one, they've done so with humility. Two, they've done so, probably thought about it and prayed about it for a long time. And so I should receive that judgment, if you will, in a, in a gracious manner. I'm not saying it's easy, but that's one thing I think I have to continue to tell myself and to be in the word to remind us that if someone, when they do come to me and point out my sin, that I should be more gracious because you know what? They've thought about this and they've, they've taken the time in a loving and caring way. Any, any last thoughts on that? No, I definitely agree. I mean, you know, you place yourself, uh, people, uh, and I'm going to say for the most part, but you know, people do look up to the pastor and for a person to come to a pastor and do, as you've described, that really takes a lot of guts, doesn't it? And, um, or, or even, you know, approach it, a district president uh, with something like that. And you do need to have humility. You do need to recognize that you need to be teachable as well. And that's something that definitely in this position that I'm in uh, now, uh, I, I'm humbled each day. And, and I need to, to fully recognize and know that I can be taught each day as well, uh, whether it's uh, by another person in, in the district office staff, whether by it's another pastor or even by the people of God. I mean, our, our, our people of God are incredibly intelligent. Um, you know, you and I don't know the Bible as, as well as we could, even though, you know, some people think that we might have it memorized some days. There's always something for us to learn, and, and we have to approach those situations with that in mind. So as we move forward, the first five verses, I feel like it, it fits kind of nicely like a puzzle, like, oh, I got it. And then verse six comes. And then it kind of throws you all off. What is Jesus saying and why is it there? So I'm looking forward to some of the good insights from um, the good President Panzer on this one, because verse six <laughs> can be kind of challenging. Let's read that. Verse six. Do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Now, Pastor, that, that all of a sudden we're talking about dogs, we're talking about holy things, uh, you know, the, don't throw the pearls before pigs, um, and they attack you. Wow. I mean, this does not fit in the puzzle pieces. How would you begin? Yeah, you know, it, it doesn't fit. Uh, it doesn't seem to fit at all, right? And uh, Dr. Gibbs in his commentary, you know, does note that there's the unusual nature of, of what he calls this proverb at this point uh, in, in the Sermon on the Mount. And so... You know, as I tried to pick apart this verse, I was trying to look, uh, you know, within the, the context of the Gospel of Matthew itself. Uh, dogs uh, are mentioned, uh, again, in Matthew chapter 15, and the, and the context of this is the Canaanite woman. Again, she's uh, outside of the promises of God, right, just because of her heritage. Uh, we, we do know, again, that, you know, Christ came for all, but you know, at, at this point in time, you know, it hadn't been revealed in, in, in the gospel, right? And in Matthew 15, 27, uh, the, the lady says, you know, yes, Lord, uh, eat, but even the dogs eat the crumbs uh, that fall from the master's table. And, uh, and then what is Jesus replying? He says, uh, oh, woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. Uh, we take up the, the uh, worst wine or hog. Uh, we go to uh, Matthew chapter 8. And in uh, Matthew chapter 8, uh, we see there uh, that um, we've got two men uh, possessed by demons. And so what does Jesus do? He, uh, he takes the, the demons out of the men. Uh, he puts them into the hog. And the hogs run off the cliff. And then, and then the hogs 
uh, perish, right? And the people bait Jesus to, to to get get out of here, leave this region, right? Why? Well, one, uh, not only have they seen this mighty work that he's done, but they've just lost their source of income as well. Um, and so these are at least a couple of near examples that we have of, of dogs and swine in the Gospel of Matthew. But as we take this back uh, to the proverb, right, um, some notes that I had uh, from, my, from my Gospel of Matthew class, again, and we see this in the context of, of Christian people in, in Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes, the uh, uh, the blessings that we receive from Christ, um, we're thinking here of the comfort uh, that the believer receives. We're thinking here of admission to the Lord's Supper, right? I mean, how can I go and receive the Lord's Supper if I can't take the speck uh, out of my own eye? I still got sin against my brother. Um, and, and it's showing us also here you know, fellowship uh, is so precious. Uh, the fellowship of the saints, the fellowship of the believers, uh, that koinonia, that, that, that Greek word of fellowship that, uh, you know, is so prominent uh, in the New Testament and what that means for our life together as the people of Christ. And I think about that in the context of Matthew 5, anger, you know, leave your gift before the altar and go. First, we reconcile to your brother. Um, there's something to that too, like you said, going to the Lord's Supper. We we need to uh, we need to come with a humble spirit, a repentant spirit, as we as, as we go through Advent. Um, you definitely see, uh, boy, yeah. There, there's some struggles in how he's exactly saying this, but definitely humility is the theme from verses one through six as you look at this whole proverb and how we do so appropriately um, before we come to the Lord, and and with that comes our fellow believers. Other thoughts on, on verse 6? I think I would say this. I mean, you've got the last part of the verse there. I, again, if we look at this in context, you know, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. You know, how are you going to be trampled? How are you going to be uh, trodden underfoot, so to speak? How are you going to be attacked? Well, you're going to be attacked uh, when you're away from the Lord, when you're away from the fellowship of the body of Christ. Um, you know, it, it, it's as you know, as, as the hearers know, um, living in today's world is not easy. And if we if we separate ourselves from the Lord, from his gifts of word and sacrament, uh, just, I mean, the devil's got us where he wants us, for one, right. but we're missing out on those gifts that Jesus wants to give. And, and, and think of the despair. Uh, think of the troubled conscience uh, that, that a person that happens to a person over that uh, as they're not receiving that forgiveness, as they're maybe even doubting uh, that faith that they may have been raised in. And, you know, one of the realities of this, too, is just because you're receiving that mercy, like you said, the gifts of our Lord, doesn't mean you won't have the temptations to be trampled. I mean, I've I've been around people who have been in church every single Sunday, very faithful people, that when they get to that point where they might not live or they get that news, yeah, they go they go to despair. I mean, that happens as well. So it really is one of those humbling things where we realize how much we need the Lord's help. And at the same time, those people are the same ones that when they hear the sweet news of the gospel, they they once again are are, are restored, they're brought back. But that just tells you how volatile we are and how much more we need that word of God um, because it happens even to the best of us, if I can say it that way, because that's what we need throughout our lives because the devil is always working and um, uh, just like a roaring lion looking to whom he can destroy. Anything else, Pastor? Yeah, I would say to go along with that, I mean, I've seen the, the, the strongest Christians, so to speak, you know, on their deathbed. Uh, you know, struggle with those questions. You know, will I be forgiven? Um, you know, will I be in heaven? And, and what a joy it is to be there as their pastor to share with them the, the, the gospel of Christ, share with them, again, that their sins uh, are forgiven by the blood of Jesus and his resurrection from the dead and remind them of the promises given to them in their baptism. And, and again, just to remind them of those gospel promises time and time again as they are being attacked 
uh, whether it be on their deathbed or, or whether it be in some other anxious moment in their life. Let's continue on, verses 7, and we'll go through verse 11. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Now, Pastor, I've heard this referenced in in, in the light of prayer. Um, And it's it's a good one to, once again, put in context, is, uh, okay, so what I'm hearing you say is I pray, and God just gives me the good gifts. I'll pray for a new car. Boom, new car this Christmas. What do you think? (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah that's the uh that's the catch 22 there right uh the life of the christian believer is uh is definitely not a uh a bed of roses right i mean the, the life of the believer is is a life of suffering it's it's the life of walking the way of the cross um i think just real quick here you know especially as as i did adult catechesis um you know, it's probably the third lesson in that I would ask the adult confirmand, you know, especially if they were, had, had been lapsed from church for a while, or maybe they would never been to church uh, and were coming into the church, you know, and I would simply ask them, have you noticed that your life is a little harder now uh, since you started studying the Word of God and attending church? Mm. And they would all kind of perk up and look at me, and, and they're like, yeah, it, it is harder. You know, why is that? And that was a great opportunity to explain to them that, you know, the devil had you, you know, where you, where he wanted you before. And now you're in the place that he doesn't want you, and those attacks are going to come uh, all the more swiftly, uh, all the more suddenly. And so what a great gift then uh, that we have uh, with prayer, right? And uh, in prayer is nothing more than than speaking to God in in our words and thoughts. You know, I'm thinking here of Psalm 19. uh, May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Um, And and so we've got that direct line. We've got that direct access to God. Uh, But as we always pray, uh, we've always got to pray what I call these hard words or these nasty words, and that's thy will be done. And so you can ask for that car, uh, you can ask for that new bike, uh, you can ask for healing, right? But we still have to pray, thy will be done. And that's really the Christian life. I know we talked about this with oaths with Pastor Golden, is that understanding of when we make an oath, we make that oath understanding that we're saying with the, the stamp at the end of it, thy will be done. And that's a hard thing because I want my will to be done. And so that's what makes these kind of hard is that we know that the Lord will give us good gifts, but I want the gifts that I think are best for me or that I think are good. Any, how would you respond to someone when they, when they say that? Yeah, hopefully I would respond to that. I mean, I'm I'm thinking, uh, you know, obviously Christmas and, and teenage kids, right. And trying to navigate, um, you know, the teenage life right now is that, um, and, and many of your, your hearers will get this, is that, you know, your teenage children, your children think that their friends uh, have every toy, every gift in the world, and why are they so picked on they can't have that, right? Mm. And, and you try to uh, patiently and, and lovingly tell them that, you know, they have everything that they, they, they need. Um, uh, you know, the other things are more wants and desires. And, uh, and to look at how blessed uh, they are, at, and, and especially you take them back in the Christian household to the blessing of forgiveness, uh, the blessing of Christian friends uh, that they have, uh, the blessings of worship, and, um, and the gifts that God gives to his children, right, that you know, may not be tangible, that we can see here physically in the here and now, uh, but but we have the eternal heaven. We have the eternal mansion that's waiting for us. And throughout the Bible, um, we are we are instructed to pray. 
And we do so with confidence. I mean, this is a small catechism uh, language and, and to understand that we, we, we go in good cheer when we pray. We do so even if it isn't answered the way we wish, we know that when we pray, our Lord to be merciful upon us. Um, any, any thoughts on, okay, so, okay, so thy will be done. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about the joy of the prayerful life or what, why this is an important thing for us as Christians to do? Yeah, you bet. And again, I think we go back to the context of the Beatitudes, right? So we, we've got the gospel blessings that are given, uh, you know, in those Beatitudes. And we know that God wants to give good gifts to his children. Uh, he is the giver, God. Ultimately, he gives us his son, Jesus. And again, what joy this time of the year that we can, you know, we're almost on the cusp of, of remembering again that incarnation of, of Christ. Um and, and because of that, you know, God wants to, to hear from us. So when we think of that joy in prayer, you know, God not only commands and invites uh, believers to pray, you know, we, we hear these uh, in Matthew, you know, ask, seek, and knock. Uh, I'm thinking here of, of Psalm 50, you know, call upon me in the day of trouble, I will deliver you and, and you will honor, or you will glorify me. Uh, I'm thinking of, of Romans chapter 8, 26, you know, even if we can't find the words or don't know the words of what to pray, right? Uh, the Spirit helps us uh, uh, in our weakness with groans that are too deep for words. So, uh, you know, those passages should bring great comfort uh, to the Christian, um, whether it's in a good time or maybe a, a time of desperation in our lives that you know, God is with us. He is hearing our prayers. He does promise to hear. Uh, and then, uh, again, how is he going to answer? Uh, sometimes that answer may come immediately. Uh, sometimes that answer may come down the road. And sometimes the answer to prayer may be that it's not answered in this earthly life. And we have to accept that as well. I think along with that, too, uh, you know, some notes that I had written down uh, prior to our, our time together here is just, you know, what does, what does Luther encourage us to do with prayer? You know, he says, the first thing that you do when you wake up the more, in the morning, make the sign of the cross, right? Remember that you are baptized. You are, the, you are the child of God, right? So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, uh, pray the morning prayer. I would encourage people to pray the Lord's Prayer too. And then again, going back to the catechism, what does it say? Uh, go to your work joyfully. And what good news, right? You, you still may have an awful day. Things may still not go the way that you want them that day, but the name of Christ uh, is upon you. Uh, Christ is with you. You are clothed with him in your baptism. And, and that's, you know, that's your confidence. That's your joy throughout the day. And then go to the end of the day, Luther's evening prayer. Again, make the sign of the cross, pray the prayer. And then what does Luther say at the end of that? He says, go to sleep at once and in good cheer. Again, you, you may have had the worst day ever, but Christ is with you. He is with you in your despair. Uh, he strengthens uh, the weak conscience. He gives you that good conscience. And uh, you go to sleep in the knowledge of the forgiveness of sins. You go to sleep knowing that you are Christ's own. Let's continue on as Christ's own to the golden rule. I mean, this is quoted all the time. My wife, who is a para at the uh, public schools, uh, she says this is probably quoted more than anywhere else when you're working with elementary kids. Um, and so, but what does that mean for us as Christians? So we'll, we'll finish out our time, verses 12 through 14. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now, Pastor, let's begin in verse 12. Verses 13 and 14 can be kind of difficult, like verse 6 as well. But verse, verse 12, basically the golden rule. Um, we'll quote it a lot, but let's make sure we have the context right. What are your thoughts? Yeah, obviously. I mean, uh, even if I'm not a believer, um, I probably know the golden rule. I have no, <laughs> where, no clue uh, or where it comes from, but uh, here it is, right? This is, this is Jesus' words uh, given to us uh, in Matthew seven twelve, And again, in, in the context of it, um, what do I want to do as, 
as the child of God. Well, I want to exhibit. I want to live. I want to show forth uh, the righteousness of Christ that lives in me. Okay. And so uh, this is what I, you know, I try to tell people, this is the joy and the privilege of, of the Christian believer uh, to do this, uh, to, to be that salt and light to those uh, others around you. I'm, I'm sure you've used the illustration. I'm sure others have heard the illustration is that, you know, you might be the only Bible that some people uh, ever read. Uh, they're going to see Jesus in you through your actions. And so, you know, this verse can be um, greatly misquoted, especially in a, in a school setting. Um, you know, it comes more from the, the law. You better do this. You know, if I, you know, be good in line or you're going to the principal's office type deal. Mm-hmm. But from a Christian standpoint, uh, this is our privilege uh, to live out the gospel of Christ. Um, I'm taking back here to, to the end of Matthew chapter 6, 33, right? Uh, what does Jesus say? He says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you, right? So as, we, as we're as we seeking uh, the kingdom of God first, right? Uh, it, again, it, it can't help but to flow from our lives uh, to live out this golden rule, right? As we are the baptized of Christ. So as we look at that, it, that, that is definitely a law-driven statement. And we, we might try to sneak in gospel into it, but no, it's, it's all law. And I like how you really, a thread that I've seen through everything that you've mentioned to us today is that you know, be merciful as the Lord is merciful to us, that we receive this mercy, something we do not deserve, which is the grace of Christ and the forgiveness of sins and saved from our sins. This is, you know, Matthew, uh, uh, Jesus saving us from our sins, which is literally his name. And, and we do all of these things, understanding our relationship with the Lord already. And this is why 13 and 14 kind of bring us to to a point where you're like, okay, here we go. Now, how do we deal with this? Pastor, we have about five minutes left in our time, and I want to make sure 13 and 14, we really get down and and understanding the narrow gate, the destruction, um, the hard way versus the easy way. Um, We can misinterpret this as well. How do you want to start with those two verses? Yeah, let's let's start with it like this. Um, You know, what what is the narrow gate? Well, it's, it's the gate. Uh, that we follow Christ through, right? And and we're called uh, to this way through repentance and faith. And again, if we keep this in the context of, of Matthew's gospel, if we keep this in the context of, of really the Christmas season that's you know just right around the corner here, uh, go to Matthew one twenty one. You know why is Jesus sent? Well, the Bible tells us, right? He will save his people from their sin. So. God gives to us his only begotten son. He gives us the promised Messiah uh, so that he might uh, lead people to heaven uh, through the narrow gate, right? And, and uh, but the flip side of that is that, is that you just read a little bit ago, right? The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few. And if we back up to 13, right, the gate is wide, the way is easy, that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. Um, so we follow the way of Christ, and a couple of things that I've written down here are what I call uh, two of the most offensive passages in Scripture. And those are John 14, 6 and Acts 4, 12, and I think they really dovetail well uh, here into Matthew 7, 13, and 14, and John 14, 6, as, as you and your hearers probably well know, is, you know, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, right? And then Acts 4, 12, uh, salvation is found in no one else, uh, for there is no other name under heaven uh, by which we must be saved. So Christ is the way, uh, he is the path, he is the gate to life eternal, and and that is offensive to the world, right? Uh, the world wants many paths. The world wants many ways. Uh, the, you know, we're living again in this time of Christmas. Uh, how many times uh, have you heard, or do I hear, or do the people here that if, 
hey, I feel good about myself because I uh, delivered a meal to a family or I, uh, you know, I bought a gift for somebody on the angel tree. Uh, that, that's not Christianity, isn't it, right? Um, we live only from the giver God. Uh, we're given to, we need that forgiveness of sins, and from that forgiveness of sins, that's how we go forth in this world. I think something else I'd add quickly here, uh, Luke 18, I was, I was reading Luke uh, in my own personal devotions, and, and the context of Luke 18 is the parable of the persistent widow, and uh, at the end of that parable, Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And again, what a, what a, what a shocking passage, what a shocking statement that our Lord would make. But it, but it all fits here, doesn't it? It fits here with Matthew 7, uh, 13 and 14. It fits with John 14, 6. It fits with Acts 4, 12, uh, that Jesus is desirous of us. He is jealous of us. He wants us uh, to be his own people now and forever. He wants, you know, to be the first commandment God only and not share his glory, uh, not share his honor with something else. And so I think I would say this, you know, maybe to close is that you and I, uh, those who have faith in Jesus Christ, uh, we know that we're going to be there. And why do we know that we're going to be there? Because he's told us so. He's promised us so. Uh, we're baptized. Uh, we hear his word. Uh, we're receiving his supper. And so, you know, this is, I guess, one of the things I miss about being in the parish is just, you know, kind of what I would call that gospel butt kick, right? I mean, you know, get to church, right? Have the people of God get to church to receive Jesus. That's what we need during this time that we're living through. Bro, come to Je- come to church, receive the gift of Jesus. Uh, again, I'm going to give them a, a nice loving kick, right? To, to come to the place where Jesus is uh, to receive what he wants to give. Pastor Justin Panzer, District President of the Kansas District of the Lutheran Church of Missouri Synod, given us God's strong word from Matthew chapter 7. Pastor Panzer, thank you for bringing us his gifts. It's been an honor to uh, to be with you and your hearers, and uh, a blessed rest of the Advent, uh, a Merry Christmas, and a Happy New Year to you. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hands. <laughs>